Okay, so I think we'll, we'll kick off. So welcome back to this morning's plenary session. My name is Ashley McKim from BMJ Quality, and it's a pleasure to host the session this morning. Over the next 40 minutes, we're going to try and solve the problem of the 2.5 billion. That's the amount the current government has set aside to, uh, as an integration uh, transition fund. And that promises seamless transition from medical to social care. For those of you who work in the NHS, you'll realize that's not an easy problem to solve. And throughout this morning's session, I want you to really picture yourself as a patient or uh, as a family or a relative of yourself. Maybe perhaps an elderly relative who's been in hospital for the last three months, maybe after a, a hip fracture or a fall. And what happens whenever they come up to the end of their time in hospital, after they've been treated for the medical condition and they're due to be discharged, and they're told there's no care plan in place, or no community support that's been set up. Imagine the frustration and the confusion that it leads for them. And we want this morning to be much of a discussion. So we've got two fantastic speakers, but we want you to be involved as well. We're going to come to our, our, patients, our, our people's jury, but then we want to take some questions from the floor. So do please keep your questions, and we'll come to you at the end, or tweet them to us with the hashtag Future of Health. So I'm going to kick off with our first speaker, and we're really pleased to have with us this morning Sandy Keane, Sandy's president of the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services. Sandy. <laughs> save it, save it. Oh. <laughs> great, thank you very much. It's absolutely great to be here, and uh, thank you very much for asking me. And uh, um, coming to listen, I think, is one of the main things. And uh, what better subject to talk about than uh, not only the future of health, but the uh, uh, 2.5 billion pounds that has recently been announced in terms of helping to uh, help us to work together. And uh, I think I'm going to start by being terribly controversial, and I hope end by being terribly positive. So if you bear with the controversial uh, comments to start with, recognizing that there is something that we can hold on to and something we need to aspire to. And that is uh, a big question. How many times can you spend 2.5 billion pounds? Because actually there are people and there are expectations that we can spend it um, probably for, and it rises each, each day or each week actually as to how many people think that um, different uh, priorities, different interests, different things can be squeezed out of this money. And of course our starting point is the money is already being spent. It's already being spent on healthcare um, expenditure. Some, some of it's been spent on social care expenditure. And of course, the total envelope is 3.8 billion, but 1.3 of that is already agreed between us about how that is being spent, and the 2.5 is something that we want to add to. And so we uh, have got some major challenges. We've got challenges about expectation. And we've got challenges about speed of change management and prioritization about how we spend that money. Because, um, make no mistake, the uh, funding uh, uh, problems, crisis, uh, whatever you want to call it, in terms of the health service and local authorities is significant. And we can't do things except by doing things differently because we cannot carry on doing more of the same. Um, and so what I want to try to do is to concentrate uh, the rest of what I want to say on some of the things we can be doing and should be doing if we're going to be improving services alongside uh, reducing our resource base. And I think the um, first thing, which uh, I pressed too early, um, but you've already got a, 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 a clue to, is about the uh, impact of care on individuals. And uh, many of us, I'm pleased to say, are driven now by the National Voices work, which says uh, that uh, people should expect that my care is planned with people who work together to understand me and my care put me in control, coordinate and deliver services to achieve my best outcomes. And that really, for me, is the heart of this. Um, in Leeds, where I am actually on, uh, as in my day job as Director of Social Services, um, we talk about the Leeds pound. We are doomed if we talk about the NHS pound and the local government pound, because this is about communities, and this is about citizens and people, and how they receive the services that we receive. One of the things we've done um, in Leeds is to uh, sorry, 
not doing this very well, um, is to ask people what they want. And they've given us all these uh, bullet point questions. Uh, I will get this right. There we go, sorry. All these bullet points and these, these quotations, um, they don't want to keep uh, repeating themselves to lots of different people. They want people to talk to each other and get the best care for them that's available. They want to know the way through the system. They want to um, be engaged and involved in what they're doing. And it's beholden on us if you're a leader in the system, and I would argue that every single worker across health, social care, and indeed the voluntary community sector are, um, are leaders in this field to see how we can do things differently and better. So what are the factors that uh, I think should um, influence that? Um, I think that we should be seeing a number of different things in our communities as we take forward this agenda. The first thing I want to point to is something that we call in Leeds Neighbourhood Networks. All of you will have good voluntary sector capacity in your communities, working um, close to the community with people who um, need support and help. And I think that, um, I suppose my thesis about moving forward on this is that we need a new relationship with citizens, with the state, and also with the private sector. The private sector can do a fantastic job in supporting financially and with um, uh, employment of the, um, release of staff to help community groups, and we've seen lots of that around Leeds, where we've got real partnerships at local level, and every part of Leeds is covered with one of these 37 fantastic neighbourhood networks who work to support people to remain well to improve their health and well-being, to improve their social isolation, to link directly into the statutory services where concerns exist, and to work very much more constructively across the piece. We have got to encourage more of that, to help people to feel confident in what they're doing. I will get this right. The next um, area that <laughs> worked before, we will get this right. Well, I'm going to just talk about the next area and not get it on the screen. You see that what should happen, they should all bul um, bubble up. But anyway, the next uh, key feature that should be there, I believe, is good information. Uh, how many people are confused about how to get into services, how they know what's available? There are uh, CCGs are now creating their own information sources. There's national information, there's local government information. That's just all over the place. And so what actually people want to see is good information to help them traverse and get through the system. And we should be doing that together. We should not be wasting our resources to be saying, well, you go into social care in this route and health care in this route, and oh, if you need something else, then you do something else. And so we want to be working uh, closely together on that. The third area is in relation to self-care. And what we want to do uh, is to give people information and support to manage their own conditions, to have that support of local communities and uh, where uh, important um, social care, uh, to support that, to help people to be more independent, whether it is around if they've got social care needs or health care needs, or if they're, um, they're just needing uh, to understand where and when to go and get help if their situation deteriorates. The fourth area is about a single access point. Again, in Leeds, we will be having a single access point for professionals and um, ultimately for uh, people who use services or need services. Because how confusing is it and how many times have we been passed from pillar to post? And how many boundaries do we put in the way between teams? How many teams have we got working in the community? And how can we rationalise that uh, resource uh, to help people to... Uh, uh, have a, a, a better first point of access experience when uh, maybe the self-help, the independence and so on and so forth falls down or there's a crisis and people need to have that immediate uh, support. Fifthly, um, in, our, in our strategy, in our plan, is integrated teams at the front uh, door uh, based around GP practices where health and social care professionals work together to have that immediate response. Um, we're linking that to the Sir John Oldham work, which is um, around risk stratification, so that the GPs are doing risk stratification 
uh, alongside health and social care in terms of how we uh, understand the risks um, and the people who maybe could do with that greater amount of targeted res uh, support. And we've got numerous anecdotal and other examples of how by working together differently um, in a multi-professional team with the community and voluntary sector who are as almost as integral a part of that team as, as anybody else, how we can make a difference to people's lives. The sixth area I want to mention is around um, urgent um, and rehabilitative support. Uh, we now have, and I know many other areas, I, I, I'm not sort of flagging up leads as the, as the, um, the answer to everything, but I'm, I'm trying to say the sort of things that I think need to be in a comprehensive strategy, not just the one-offs. And that's around maybe integrated uh, uh, rehabilitation units um, or intermediate tier centres or whatever, where people can go either as a hospital avoidance or as an early hospital discharge, which stops people making those urgent and uh, rapid decisions at the wrong time. How many times do we think we have admitted people to long-term care straight from hospital after a crisis um, when actually uh, with a good rehabilitative package and uh, some uh, good wraparound services that might not have been necessary and it might not have been what the person wanted ultimately. Um, and so that's a really important part of our toolbox if you like in terms of uh, redesigning services. Uh, also, um, the manana of, uh, or the, the, the holy grail, should I say, of the uh, integrated care record. Um, how many times do our workers say, and I've visited many, and when you say, what is the real problem, how, what can we do differently to really make it easy for you, and they'll say, share information. And we know that um, actually having a single system is just not, is out of the question in terms of cost and uh, where we all are. But with the development of technology and with the ability to use different platforms, that becomes a real possibility. And indeed, it is um, our aspiration at least, but by next year, we will have an accessible care record uh, that's downloaded for everybody to be able to see with real-time information. And, uh, and that is something that we need to be using this money for in terms of really uh, pump priming because it costs money, but it makes such a huge difference in terms, of, uh, in terms of development. And ultimately, of course, we need to recognize that that is a, uh, is a person held record so, uh, where people have the control of what goes on and what goes off and also who sees it and who doesn't see it, which I think uh, we now have a, a, a target to achieve for people with long-term conditions uh, by 2015. So there's a lot of work to do there. And finally, I just want to say something about the interface between secondary, primary and community care. Uh, because I think that we, uh, we know that is the you know, fundamental difficulty in terms of how do we redesign services. Uh, we often say it's about you know, moving um, work from secondary care into community and primary care. We've got to build up community, primary and social care in order to feel that there's a safe and reliable service. We've discovered that there's a huge variation in risk um, appetite uh, between the different sectors in terms of understanding what is available in the community to support people. And we've had fantastic progress where we now have um, uh, secondary care geriatricians, people who work with older people, who now work into the community on a, you know, a full-time basis and out, you know, reach out into the community uh, where, where actually the services are seen far more as a community service and the beds are just the, the support beds for people who um, uh, obviously will still need them in the future and are, are in serious need. Um, so all of that requires quite fundamental shifts and, quite, and strategic shifts, but from the bottom up as well as the top down. The managers in the system can't sort this, and neither actually can the front line alone. So we need to be working together and redesigning our service together, um, which again has been a fundamental part of our work most importantly with the citizens who use the services and who have um, the most significant impact on saying how it is for them. And we've um, very much uh, operated on the basis of we want to innovate together. 
And um, we've had some innovations that have been uh, led by citizens. We've had some that have been led uh, very much by providers, um, either single providers or cross providers. And we've had uh, some that are um, industry led around um, the innovative technologies, for example, uh, telecare and telemedicine and so on. We've also worked very hard at knowing how we measure our success. Um, we've got the, the care record that we've talked about. We've now got invested in a system called CareTrack, which actually tracks individual people through the system from health and social care, where you can actually see the impact of uh, um, interventions. So you can see from hospital discharge into, say, residential and nursing home care, how many people are readmitted over uh, at what speed. And you can target, we can target now the residential and nursing homes who we feel those numbers are too high and we can make a, a significant difference and, and there are many other applications that we're using for that um, and we're also um, using an outcome based model uh, designed by um, our citizens uh, to say what's important for them and we're monitoring their experience after um, our interventions to make sure it happens. You may or may not have noticed that in all of our, the slides that I've um, uh, talked about so far, there's been a key in the corner, or somewhere in the corner, the observant amongst you. And I want to finish with Elsie's story, who is, the, who is our inspiration in Leeds, because she was a lady who was caring for her husband with end-of-life um, uh, problems, and um, she, ha she describes what she was given initially when she was supporting his care, being given a bunch of keys. And she was never very sure which key fixed, fixed or uh, fitted which lock. Sometimes when she opened a door and she found one that fitted, she got a really good service. And sometimes it, it wouldn't turn. And sometimes she got the wrong service. When we introduced the uh, integrated team and she had um, a single service um, designed uh, with her across health and social care at that end of life point, she described it as having been given one golden key. And that for me is what we need to be um, searching for as we look to spend our um, 2.5 or our continued 3.8 to make sure we make the very best use of every pound, which essentially belongs to citizens, not organisations. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. And I think that challenge of how we work together, how we share information, is a very real one that we, we face in the NHS. And it'd be great, I think, when we come to the questions, to hear any examples of how people have had successes with that. Um, just a quick reminder that all the slides from the speakers are available on the Future of Health website, so you can view Sandy's whizzy, flashy slides later at your own time. Um, so next up, a man who I think needs no introduction. Um, he's Chief Executive of the fantastic um, organisation Turning Point. Um, it's Lord Victor Adebole. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, I know you said that not all roads don't lead to Leeds, but I'm from West Yorkshire and I think they do. Um, <laughs> Leeds is the centre of the universe, as is West Yorkshire. Um, I do feel a bit nervous. I, I've sent a little tweet out because when in, I'm in front of, I think Malcolm's in the audience. He's, he kept, he's told me twice. There you go. <laughs> Um, so that's the boss, and then, and then the really important people, I've got the patients um, in front of us. So it's a bit like the X Factor, and um, so I really, I love you all. Um, I just need to tell you, so um, we've got this, this 2.5 billion, and I want to kind of say a few things about this, and hopefully um, suggest some ideas. Um, the money, um, the money's a signal really. I've always thought money's a signal about what's important um, and I think the 2.5 billion is a signal that uh, basically integration is important. But it says a bit more than that and I was a big supporter of the idea of this integration budget and when uh, Turning Point gave evidence at the, um, I think it was the Social Care Committee of the House of Commons or something, I actually said that the change should start with the money because everybody's focused on money. Um, everybody's focused on it and if you want people to do things differently then basically incentivize them to do that and since money seems to be a good incentive let's start with the money so 2.5 billion is a, is a good start um, 
uh, but it's not enough. It's a, it's a significant shift and a significant signal of actually the direction of health and social care and where it needs to go. And actually, you know, one of the problems I have with, with change generally is that we don't really understand what resistance is about. I know there's been, there's gonna, there's been a few speeches so far at the conference that are about change and, and culture. And the, the thing about those things is that the words fall like snow, don't they? Change and culture, and we all think it's dead easy. No one ever really talks about resistance. And I've got to be honest with you, um, health and social care, riddled with it. Riddled with it. And frankly, if it wasn't riddled with it, we would have changed it years ago because the patients are here, aren't they? So when people talk about the NHS and people talk about change, they talk about it as though it's driven by the need for them because of the money. I've never thought that, ever. I think that the money should be the last reason to change what we do. The reason why we should change what we do actually isn't just because of you, the patient panel, it should be us, actually. It should be us. And the thing that's always killed me is in the times of so-called plenty, organizations like Turning Point would present ideas about how you can radically shift the design and delivery of integrated health and social care services from the ground up that would be hugely challenging to the power of the system as an owner of the means of production, right? And I've got to be honest, we never got anywhere. It was a real struggle because people didn't think they had to change. And it was hugely disappointing because actually the reason to change is people change. That's the reason why we have to do this. And the money is just a signal. And I think we have to understand resistance because if we don't, we're doomed not to change. So there's a very simple formula for resist to, to understanding resistance. Some of, you, some of you might know it, the glyco beckford formula, I think it's called. But basically, it's very simple. To overcome resistance, this is a clue, right? Um, McKinsey had charged about three grand for this, but I'm going to give it to you for free, right? Because I'm just that kind of guy. Um, you, can, you can slip something in later, but it's, it's basically simple. Dissatisfaction, right? Discomfort times vision, right? Vision, right? Times the first step, the first thing that has to change has to be greater than the resistance. And the formula assumes that there will be resistance. And the resistance in the system of health and social care is fundamentally about power. It is. I'll be honest, right? You know, if those of you that think that it's not about power, we can have a chat afterwards. But it is about power. So, I think that there are lots of examples out there of integration that have been happening, but are in danger of not getting repeated, developed, engaged with, rolled out, because the people who've done it don't have the power. That's what it's fundamentally about. Earl's Court, Turning Point has this wonderful, I'll say this because you know, they're paying me, NHS England paying me a little bit, but they're paying me. There's lots of other examples. Um, we have this, um, this, this, this wellbeing centre. It was commissioned by, I actually have to say, a very brave commissioner. Um, because what she said, what the PCT said, was we want something different. We don't just want a GP surgery. We don't just want the usual experience, I often say this, of people, after my experience, the common experience of not getting an appointment unless you're bleeding from the eyes. We want something which is truly integrative, which starts with the experience of the consumer and actually isn't just about the GP interaction, it's about health and social care. Can you do that for it? We responded, we loved it. We, we did a, a really strong design. We, we won, we, we got partners, um, Greenbrook, we worked with um, GPs, dentists, sexual health and well-being, but not as separate entities. We, we looked at um, literally what happens when you walk through the door. 
we, don't, we didn't have receptionists, we had coordinators, people who made you feel welcome, who made you feel as though you could talk to them, actually made you feel as though perhaps you might not want to see the doctor, perhaps you just want to talk to somebody about your joblessness, your, your social care position, about you. So that actually, you might, you might have more time with the doctor than those statutory eight minutes or whatever to get a fully rounded picture. We wanted it to be welcoming and different. And we can't, we've done it. It's there. It's there. But you know what the challenge is? Because we have a CCG, because we have public health, because we have local government, there is a risk, I'm very honest with you, that we won't have it any longer. Why? Because suddenly public health fund the sexual health bit. <laughs> it's, local government might fund the adult social care bit. The CCG fund the primary care, um, NHS England funds the primary care bit, and I'm already running out of bits. And we have to put those bits together and convince each bit that's protecting its budget and its role to say, you know what, it's not your money. It's about what the people in this area want, and we can prove that. And that's the fundamental challenge. That's what the 2.5 billion is about in my view. It's about how do you create those services that speak to the day-to-day -day experience of the people like you in this room? How do we create bespoke services? Because I tell you what, Elsie, my mum, me, actually don't give a monkey's chuff about the demarcation between what is health and what is social care. They just want the service to work, please, and they want it to work for them. They want it to be bespoke. So that's what we should be doing. And that's what we could do. It is not impossible. It is doable and it is repeatable. And the reason why we don't do it is because we have resistance and that resistance is about power and we need to understand that. <laughs> because if we don't, we are doomed to make the same mistake. It's the old Einstein quote, isn't it? You know, you're never gonna solve the problem in the same mindset that created it. Not rocket science. E equals MC squared is, but that isn't rocket science. Right? So, for me, and for, I think, the system, it's one of the reasons why commissioning is so intrinsic to this. And I, I say this, and Malcolm's sick of hearing me say it, because it, kind of, it kind of gets meaningless with repeat, but actually, I think it's fundamental. We have this idea about what commissioning is and what it isn't, and if you ask 100 people, they all give you different ideas. I think it's very simple. And I think Sandy touched on some of it. Commissioning is the means by which you understand the needs of an individual and or a community such that you can build a platform for procurement. Sounds dead easy. Until you start to understand what that means. And I think what it means is that commissioning should be fundamentally about putting the community at the centre of understanding the kinds of services that they go to, they understand, and they can be involved in delivering. That's difficult, that's interesting. I think most social health and social care interventions that are going to prevent people from going to hospital, keep people in their communities healthy and engaged, do not require people as qualified as any of you. <laughs> they do require the use of those people, but not at the same scale. And fundamentally, that's how we're going to save money. So one of the things that um, Turning Point's been doing is understanding how you repeatedly and reliably engage communities in designing services, the like of which we have not seen, but are necessary in order to save the funding and generate the kind of demand management and, su and supply kind of design that is necessary for the future. And we've developed, been developing this thing called Connected Care, which I don't have time for you to go into. But, but the fundamental about Connected Care is that we know that for every one pound spent, we can save four pound 40. Um, then if you look at demand on public services and other values like quality of life expectancy, that goes up to 23 pound 10, 28 pound 50. So you're getting real savings. We hired economists to tell us this. We thought it was blindingly obvious, but you need economists sometimes to tell you the blindingly obvious. And in order to do connected care properly, what connected care creates is a challenge to power. Well, because what it does is gather 
the experience of individuals, of consumers, and it says, what does your service need to be? What does it need to look like? What does it need to do? How does it need to relate to you? How do the professionals need to arrange themselves in terms of skills, aptitude, and attitude in order that you will use those services? You will engage with them. Can you be employed in them? And then it takes that design to the owners of the means of production and it compares what they've got with what they could have. <laughs> and actually what they could have is usually better, cheaper, more effective, impactful, all that kind of stuff. And that's when the challenge starts because they have to change, not the consumer. And I think that's fundamental about the future of health and social care. It's not what the statutory services will need to do in that kind of normal way. It's about how the consumers will generate change by designing and delivering integrated services in their interests. That is the real challenge, and that's what we've got to face. And in my view, that's the resistance. So if you want to ask me what you want to spend 2.5 billion on, the answer's simple. Spend it on people, because it's their money. Thank you. Victor, thank you very much. I'm going to quickly move on because we've got about eight minutes, I think, left. And we want to get some discussion and comments from the floor. So I want to move first of all. Have we got Anya, Anya in our people's jury this morning? No. And you're in the back. Yeah, she's over there waving. Um, for their reflections sure. on what take... they've heard. Yep. Because I think looking at people's eyes um, during that session, um, thank you, Sandy, because you brought social care into the room. Um, and I think that has been a message throughout all of yesterday that it felt it was missing. This is a conversation we all have to be in together. So I just wonder if somebody wants to provide any initial reflections from here. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's really refreshing to hear what both speakers have been saying. But it does worry me that um, at the moment we talk about seven-day hospitals, but... We've not got the seven-day care. It's still not joining up. And this is where we need to go so that when you do leave hospital, it's all there in place and you're not sat there in bed waiting to be discharged because you don't know who's going to be looking after you when you go out. Thank you. Um, for me, it's been the best, it's been the best plenary yet. Um, because social care has been involved in it, because it's, it, it's about the blindingly obvious, which is joined up working, joined up thinking, joined up working. The thing that scares me is the fact that you've got a fantastic working model in Earl's Court, as you were saying, <clears throat> and, you know, it's that whole thing of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and unfortunately they're going to make it break, it sounds like, and, and that scares me because if, if it is obvious and as you said put the 2.5 billion you know it's the people that it's about um, if something is working by design and you know the whole thing you said about you know coordinators when you come into rather than and you might not you might just want to speak to somebody I spent half my life just wanting to talk to my GP I didn't need any treatment from him. I just needed to talk to somebody and, and there wasn't anything there. So if this is, in, to me, it's quite obvious that that's the way forward for both of the, what you've both been talking about. But I have the real kind of reticence that, that this isn't going to happen and it worries me. I just got to, I um, spent a couple of weeks in hospital, um, on Dumb Standing, by the way, in September. Hi, Victor. It was good meeting you earlier. Um, and the thing that bit I spend the 2.5 billion on is making sure there's Wi-Fi in hospitals and decent meals that are nutritious. I was in hospital, half hanging out the window, trying to get a data connection, just so I felt some connection with the outside world. I ended up discharging myself twice and being rushed back into hospital because I, with my mental health problem, I couldn't cope with it. And having nice food to eat and a Wi-Fi connection would have really helped. So, yeah, Wi-Fi and good food, please. Victor, Sandy, any, any comments on that? Because we, we've got both of you mic'd up, so we should be able to get you to speak from there. Well, I think we got through to the next round, actually. I think, <laughs> um, I, I think, I think 
the, the, somebody talked about hospital discharge, and um, there's two things I'd say, well, in response to all of it, really, which is an example of the hospital discharge. Um, my mum my had an appalling... Well, there wasn't any hospital. There was a great poster that described it, but it didn't happen. And I think my, it goes back to what I was saying before. I think in most communities, they understand what should happen when somebody's leave, leaving hospital. And actually, there's a great will to help design it and actually be involved in delivering it. But I think we don't ask. We don't, and there's methodologies as ways of asking. I think it can be done, and where it is done, it could be repeated. But I think there are lots of reasons not to. <laughs> there's actually lots of reasons not to. And we need to understand that those reasons are very real. You know, there's lots of bureaucracy, lots of reasons not to. Um, and I think we need excuse removers. And I would start with designing local pathways, local engagements, which reflect the local community, because the pathway out of a hospital in an area with lots of Bangladeshi women is going to be different from, and actually involve people in the delivery of some of those services. I don't mean big society. I mean paying people. And you, you, you will get a more effective, a, a more effective, a more effective service. And on the Earl's Court thing, thank you for what you said about that. I think if I've got anything to do with it, it won't happen. But part of the problem with Earl's Court is that it's experimental. So the excuse, not the rationale for not funding it, is is much bigger than the rationale for funding it, because people re result, and it's part of that formula thing. We have to be risk aware, not risk averse. The risk averse will kill at any innovation. Sandy, any quick comments? Um, well, yes, I don't think that Wi-Fi and um, meals are entirely my bag, but I, w I, th I think it's a really good point about technology and the fact that we, are, we need to plan our services in a new world where people do want um, Wi-Fi and where actually they are, um, m uh, increasingly they and their families are much more reliant on technology and it can be used in a different way for good rather than um, the old traditional way. So I think it's a fundamentally good point. Hospital discharge we have got to improve on without a doubt and um, look at how the, the relationship between statutory and community services in terms of who does what and how we can do it differently and um, reach into hospitals to help people to come out rather than wait for hospitals to... Um, to discharge, and we've got all sorts of issues, I think, about 24-hour types of services. There's some horror stories still, and unacceptable horror stories about people's experience late at night or early in the morning from A&E and that sort of thing, and, and that has absolutely got to be a must. And in relation to Earl's Court, I know it's London, but the issues are the same around how you join public health, social care, and CCG funding, and it also touches on that whole thing about evidence base. Um, which is a really thorny issue and we haven't got time for, but you know, we use evidence base as an excuse for not doing things because there isn't the evidence there, and we don't use evidence base enough to say, what have we got to stop doing because it's not effective. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. We so we'll, we, we, we'll, we, we'll take two quick questions from the audience very quickly, questions or comments. First two hands to go up, one at the very front over here in the blue shirt, and one other... Uh, question or comment over on that side. Thank you. <clears throat> I found the speaker's comments quite interesting. Uh, I actually have a partner who probably have no trouble spending that money in a couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, perhaps as a radical thinker and for a bit of fun, perhaps we ought to look at the way we actually pay for our health. Rather than paying doctors when we're ill, how about paying them to keep us fit? If, if so take, the moment we fall ill, they don't get paid. We take the other question first of all. We'll come back to our, our speakers after that. Uh, good morning, everybody. It was really inspiring to hear those presentations, so thank you very much. Okay. Uh, my name is Elisa Aldevas. I'm from Hertfordshire County Council. I'd just like to share with you all in the room that we are um, integrating with our health colleagues in running two home-first pilots in counties in Hertfordshire where we're truly integrating health and social care. And the pilots have been running for about nine months and we're working closely with our CCG colleagues and we're about to evaluate the pilots. But I definitely think this is the way forward. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. So we'll come back to our two speakers just for some closing comments and responses to that and then we'll wrap things up. Um, Victor, can you go first, please? Uh, I think the point about incentives is a very good one. I actually worry intensely about Quif, Quaff and the current incentive programme 
and whether, you know, it goes back to the, you're not going to solve the problem with the same thinking that created it. So I do think incentives are important. I know that was a kind of flippant remark, but I do think the incentives are critical um, because they are used as an excuse and we need excuse removers. So I think, I think there's a real problem there, a technical problem as well as a change problem. I think um, Hertfordshire, fantastic, I'm glad you mentioned that because we run an integrated service in, in Hertfordshire and, and um, it saves money and it stops people from being passed from pillar to post. And the only thing that frustrates me is that there isn't more of them and Hertfordshire proves it can be done. So let's do it. Um, my closing remark is linked to the title of the future of health. Um, I think that there is a saying that goes, um, the future is with us, it's not just very evenly distributed yet. And I think that we need to look at where the innovation is happening, where the difference is being made, and um, strive for those changes um, all, all the way. Um, using the new technology, which is a particular hobby horse of mine, but also um, using the different ways of working and different relationships, addressing the financial flows and all the rest of it. But, but we have got to keep driving this agenda or else uh, we're not going to succeed. And we Can need I just to... say one more thing? Sorry, sir. Uh, the NHS England call for action, I think, is a critical interac interactive point. You know, I think if people want the, the NHS to be as we've described it, then you need to tell us, you need to engage with that call for action because it will define the future. So get involved. Great. Can we just thank our two speakers for the really inspiring speech today? <laughs> and uh, be before we go, it's that call to action that's very important. So we've got a pledge wall downstairs. Please go down, take the ideas you've taken away from the session, put them in the pledge wall. Um, also, please go and look at the posters. We've lots of posters up around the venue downstairs, really inspiring projects. And finally, Go and see some of the exhibitors as well. They've got really good stories to tell. So thank you again for coming this morning. We'll see you back for the next sessions. Thank you. You're excellent. It was really good. I think we've come